Welcome to my world. Where every night is Halloween. There's no way out. WCW shall rest in peace. Step to the madness. Slim Jim presents WCW's Halloween Havoc. Sunday, October 26th, live and only on pay-per-view. Call your cable or satellite company to order now. Again, wrestling fans, and welcome to another edition of the Good Friends Better Enemies podcast. My name's Jay, and we are once again introducing another episode in our series, Card Subject to Change, in which we are bringing on guest bookers and guest analysts from all over the podcasting world, as well as friends of the show. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on this week's special guest, friend of the show, and one of the members of the E8 podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Bourne. Steve, how you doing, pal? Not too bad, buddy. Thanks for having me on. You got it. Uh, thank you so much for jumping on. We are excited to have you, and uh, you have a very special pick for us this week. We kind of decided to let you have the run of the place and decide uh, what we were going to be talking about this week, and would you like to fill in our listening audience on what they are going to be uh, treated to this week? Yeah, sure. Uh, we decided um, that uh, with uh, October coming up, We'll go to uh, Halloween Havoc, uh, and probably one of the most notables was 1997. Not just for um, continuing with the NWO WCW storyline, but uh, probably one of the most famous matches in WCW history, Eddie versus Ray, the Cruiserweight title for uh, Ray's Mask. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, it was a very interesting show. Uh, you and I were just talking off air in regards to this particular card, and talking about how a lot of people kind of equate 1997 WCW to the kind of their zenith or height of their popularity or their you know, kind of cohesive booking. And after watching the show, I got to tell you, uh, this was not their best effort, in my humble opinion. Uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of changes made. Spoiler alert, for, alert folks, that I am going to be rebooking this week and Steve's going to be along for the journey, critiquing me with his encyclopedic knowledge of wrestling and specifically this particular time frame of WCW. But before we get into the rebooking, Steve, I would like to, for you to maybe talk to us a little bit about your podcast. Tell us about what you're doing, what you're excited about. Uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, give us some information. Tell us where we can find you. Floor is yours, my friend. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, uh, my buddy Griff and I, uh, we do, um, don't do it as often as we want just because of work and stuff getting in the way, but we do a uh, podcast, uh, it's called the E8 Podcast, where we basically take a sports topic and do a countdown. It's kind of similar to uh, Mike and Tyler, um, but this is more sports related. Um, we just got one in the books that we did about a week ago, we're just doing some editing, going to get up soon, where I did the, where it was my version of a list, and I did the top eight trades in Blue Jays history that benefited, obviously, um, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. Um, yeah, no, and occasionally we'll just basically talk about sports for an hour as well, just uh, a rant, uh, almost a bit of cathartic, therapeutic, um, uh, just random sports talk. Mostly it is uh, Blue Jays and a uh, bit of hockey and a bit of um, basketball as well. But uh, yeah, no, um, just like it's basically two buddies. Uh, like Griff and I have known each other for over t for twenty years. We are the best men at each other's weddings, so we kind of know each other a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. So it's a lot of Toronto-based, sort of Toronto-centric sports talk. Which yeah, we've done uh, some, I mean, sorry, done go some ahead. Canada stuff is like nationwide stuff as well. Oh, awesome. Okay, well, I mean, one of the most polarizing. Um, areas for sports is definitely the Toronto area with the Jays, the Leafs, and of course the Raptors. So you've got a lot of, to coin a phrase from our buddy Tyler, meat on the bone with that particular subject. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of rants, um, I'm going to give you the floor again because I didn't get a chance to see last night's Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Spoiler alert again, folks, we're recording on a Monday night, just about an hour shy of uh, Monday Night Raw. 
And I haven't had a chance to see last night's offering of Extreme Rules. I heard there was some interesting booking choices on that one, much akin to what's going on with this WCW pay-per-view we're covering tonight. So, Steve, why don't you walk us through some of your highlights, and maybe some of your lowlights of what you saw last night at Extreme Rules? Uh, definitely the highlights uh, were the Usos and Street Profits stole the show. Um, but uh, during the pre-show, they filmed a segment to give us a bonus match, which ended up being a curtain jerker. Also a really good match, which was the New Day versus Styles almost and Bobby Lashley. Um, and again, with the New Day, you know you're going to get a really good match. I mean, it's, t- it's tough for them to have a bad match with anybody. But um, then you've, they like say, that no titles changed hands last night. Uh, which wasn't expected because this was booked as a bit of a throwaway pay-per-view to get ready for the draft and Crown Jewel coming up. But, um, yeah, no, with last night, though, to me, the best match, I think, was uh, Street Profits versus uh, Usos. Plus, the triple threat for the United States title, was I thought, was really good. And they actually led you to believe that Jeff Hardy actually had a chance. I mean, Priest wins with a basic roll-up uh, over Sheamus. But again, um, they, I don't know what they're going to do with um, Alexa Bliss's character after Charlotte literally ripped up Lily. And hopefully they maybe abandon the, the haunted doll situation. And then going into the main event, you had Finn Balor lose because the top rope broke. And unless they do a, a thing where the I don't know how they all explain it to make it believable. But up until then, it was actually a pretty good match. And then uh, we also got the return of uh, Sasha Banks last night, uh, causing a double DQ in the um, Becky versus Bianca match. I mean, overall, I'd, out of 10, I'd probably give it a five, five and a half. Nothing special. So, solid in-ring work. But again, WWE is set back by their own booking. So uh, overall, I'd say if you've got maybe three hours to kill, it's not a terrible watch, but it's definitely not one of the better offerings. Yeah, it sounds to me like it's more of like an elongated Raw or SmackDown. Well, I guess the same same length of time as a Raw or maybe a longer SmackDown. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing of note on that card for me specifically. I mean, obviously, you want to give credit to all the performers that were, were on the show last night and gave gave a solid effort. Yeah, like um, the in-ring work last night was, was, and that's the problem is WWE's in-ring work. I don't think anyone really has a problem with it. It's the booking. Yeah, the booking's pretty lackluster. I think also there is a little bit of a disconnect in terms of the in-ring product with certain performers because you have to remember that so many of these particular roster members came from the PC and they've mm-hmm. taught a lot of the similar type of wwe you know i don't hate to hate to call it soft style but it's really more of a pattern style than maybe you'd get with different indie performers coming in from different uh, for the lack of a better term territories and things of that nature so when you bring a lot of people in you try to you know kick their habits or you know their perception of bad habits out of them and make them all very sort of uniformed in terms of their working style it can sometimes fatigue the product when you see a lot of matches that are very similar. Uh, but with that being said, obviously, you, you did have a, a fairly solid outing, as you alluded to last night. I mean, I heard that that Jeff Hardy um, United States Championship match was quite good. Uh, I refer to Jeff Hardy specifically because I think that he took a pretty serious bump last night. And I love the fact that they finished with a roll up. I love when we get an unexpected finish like that, something that we don't get a lot of in today's booking. Um, because we're always, you know, typically seeing 50 super kicks and, and, uh, near falls and false finishes beyond belief. So five I'm quite happy to hear three, su- five melted drivers, three super kicks. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so that's my, that's my biggest uh, issue actually with AEW is that I find that specifically with these young bucks matches, I mean, nobody's going to take away from the young bucks being outstanding performers, being outstanding tag team one of the greatest tag teams in the industry today, but I lose my suspension of disbelief when I see someone literally getting hit with 20 super kicks or double super kicks. And as you alluded to five Meltzer drivers near fall after near fall after near fall and false finish after false finish. 
at this point, I feel like my intelligence is being insulted. Big time. And I don't understand why they're so hi- highly praised. In terms of technical execution, fine. I'm all good with that. Yeah, you guys have a really solid snug match that looks realistic. Uh, you have your obligatory 50 leg slaps per match as well, which is fine. But, you know, at a certain point, the bloom is off the rose. And I'm not yeah. going to be interested in seeing a match where I know that after I've seen... Can you imagine back in the Attitude Era if we had seen Austin hit 25 stunners on the rock? I mean, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think actually, uh, going back to the uh, triple threat US title match last night, to me, one of the highlights... Was Jeff Hardy's ready to do a swanton? Sheamus pushes him off, goes to the top ropes, and starts doing Jeff Hardy's dance on the top rope, <laughs> and then yeah, gets a knee on Priest. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw a meme of that, which was pretty funny. Oh, uh, no, I have to go back and check out some of the highlights of this of this show for sure. But I guess the my point of bringing up was fantastic. I beg your pardon. The first half of that card was really good. Yeah, and and so that's my that was sort of my point and my segue of bringing in AEW into the conversation because. I feel like the amount of momentum that they have right now as a company is so far ahead of where it was expected to be. And of course, obviously, they're not going to be catching up with the WWE in terms of metrics, um, you know, earnings reports. And, you know, they're not going to um, countries where they're getting $50 million per shot, obviously. But um, in so many measurable metrics in terms of fan interest, I think that they're the superior product right now. They're on such a roll. They have so much momentum that I think that there might be some legitimacy to them becoming maybe not a financial threat, but we might slowly be seeing the me- the needle move here uh, away from the WWE. And at the same token, the WWE keeps on going back to the well with a lot of these legends who I love to see, but I'm sorry, in 2021, Goldberg going for the WWE Championship or the Universal Championship is not the answer anymore. No. Uh, to me, what'll be real interesting is to see who the first AEW star is to jump. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, you read that Brian Cage isn't happy right now. Uh, maybe even somebody uh, in Ethan Page or somebody right now who's being, dip- I, I don't want to say held back, but maybe possibly a little underutilized because of all the ex-WWE guys they brought in. Um, yeah. But uh, like you say, Brian, I don't know if you saw Brian Cage's wife uh, went on uh, social media to explain that uh, she feels that Cage, ever since he lost that FTW meaningless title, um, has been underutilized. And I think Cage getting a second shot in WWE, Vince would love a guy like him. Yeah, I don't know if um, that's going to be doing any favors for for Cage. You know, a family member going online and tweeting something about the person's career. I mean, I don't know if you'd see back in the day Janet Gretzky going on Twitter and saying something about the Oilers trade to Los Angeles. So, um, I mean, listen, I'm not saying you can't. By all means, voice your concerns and voice your opinions. I'm just saying sometimes that that kind of stuff and causing, you know, a little bit of noise and a little bit of controversy can actually have the opposite effect it's intended to have. So yeah. anyhow, you know, we'll see what happens. It's going to be yeah. really interesting there. I can, I do think that this is the most interesting time in wrestling since the attitude era, since the Monday night wars, there's constantly mm-hmm. news going on. So I think we're due for a very exciting, you know, back half of 2021 and going into 2022. And it's going to be really interesting to see where we are in terms of, uh, you know, company dynamics and, and fan interest in both companies moving forward. I mean, Vince always pulls a rabbit out of his hat, especially around yeah. WrestleMania season. But I'm starting to wonder if if there aren't that many rabbits left to pull out of that hat anymore. Well, I don't know if you heard the news today that uh, Royal Rumble, it's going to be on a Saturday this season. Which is awesome. Uh, yeah, Saturday, January 29th at the Dome in St. Louis. Yeah, it's another stadium show. Um, and yeah, it's going to be on for the first time. It's going to be on a Saturday. Yeah, I think that they should start making those big tent pole events on Saturdays. I think it like for for an extreme rules, you can do it on a Sunday. But yeah. for I, I prefer the I prefer the Royal Rumble on a Saturday. We watched SummerSlam on a Saturday. It gave me Sunday to recover if you're going to have some buddies over and crack a couple tall boys or, you know, yeah. get into the Woodford Reserve or what have you. So. Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so you get that little buffer, right? Um, yeah, you get a day to recover, essentially. It, you can go back and watch go back and watch the main event that might be a little fuzzy to you from the night before. Well, that's why I always take the Monday after Mania. I always take that day off work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not a bad idea. But, uh, Steve, if, if you want to continue on here, I don't really have much more else to cover in terms of current day. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on with the uh, dark side of the ring revelations that have come out in the last little while. But I really don't yeah. want to touch on that stuff. I think that, yeah. you know, other we'll people Mike can Tyler talk about that. that. Yeah, other people can talk about that if they like. I'm, uh, I'm just not in the move to, 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 you know what, to coin a phrase from uh, Jim Ross, I don't have any room in my carry-on for negatives. So exactly. I'm just going to... Uh, Let's just get into some fun booking. How's that sound? Yeah, let's do this. All right, man. So we are going to go back in time to Halloween Havoc 1997, which took place on October 26th, 1997, at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, you specifically picked this Halloween Havoc 1997, and I'm just curious, do you have any particular memories of this time frame, or, or what really drew you to this year in particular? Uh, well, 1997, I still think, is the greatest year for professional wrestling, period. Um, you've got the, uh, I mean, the NWO thing, especially with Kurt. Uh, to me, the most interesting part of that NWO storyline was uh, the Kurt Henning Four Horsemen thing. Plus, you had the, I mean, that's when the Cruiserweight title, I think, became almost, uh, to the true diehards, is about as meaningful as the WCW title did. Um with guys like Eddie, Ray, Jericho just coming on the scene. And then you've got, uh, eventually when Jericho turns heel, you've got the Malenkos uh, really starting to get to prominence. At least see, with WCW, they were 97. Their cruiserweights were, were to me, the part I watched. Because you knew you were going to get an entertaining 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I can't disagree with you at all on that. I think that um, part of Nitro's success initially was much attributed to the cruiserweights. And of course, you know, the NWO coming in, you know, around 10 months after the, the beginning of Nitro. Nitro debuted in September 95. We had the NWO come in in July 96. So um, I do feel like a lot of the Nitro main events from the first 10 months or so were were fairly similar. It was all sort of circling around you know flair hogan savage and maybe uh maybe the giant sometimes sting and luger being there too but yeah i think definitely the cruiserweights helped to separate the product without question so uh you know of course we have to talk about a couple of things that were going on in and around this time if you remember it was i believe the 100th episode of monday nitro and it was the go home nitro for um road wild 1997 we saw lex luger submit hollywood hogan for the world mm -hmm. heavyweight championship and of course go into the uh road wild pay-per-view as the champion and then of course losing the title back to hogan so it was a quick little uh title change there i think for 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 the audience and and it was a great moment actually one oh, of the yeah. moments in nitro's history up until that point do you have any memory of that yeah i do i i remember um I remember when Luger won the title because that was the I think that was probably one of the first major losses that the NWO really took, especially clean. Because um, usually when the NWO lost like them, it was by their own disqualification or something like that. But I mean, it was Hogan's first loss in God knows how long. Um, and I just remember after Hogan got got put up in the torture rack, he gave up within a, a second or two. Uh, and um, just the entire roster uh, putting Luger up on their shoulders, very similar to the way they did with Sting in Starcade 97. Yeah, it was a great moment for Nitro, for sure. Uh, then, of course, you know, we not too long after that, we would go into Arn Anderson's retirement speech, and then, of course, you know, the NWO mocking Arn Anderson's retirement speech. There's been a lot of controversy in terms of what happened there and, you know, maybe mm -hmm. taking some shots that weren't necessary and all that, that kind of thing. But that sort of set up the stage for the fall brawl pay-per-view in 1997, which then, of course, as you alluded to, uh, ended with Kurt Hennig turning on the uh, four horsemen to join the NWO. And that kind of brings us up to this point at um, Halloween Havoc 1997. There's obviously a lot of ebbs and flows in terms of booking. And I, I felt like going into this particular pay-per-view, as much as we both kind of agree that the pay-per-view itself was maybe a little lackluster and overbooked, uh, 
I think that the story going into it was really very well told. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, the storylines were the stories were great. Um, there was a lot of intrigue. It's just again, just the as we're going to get into the overbooking. Uh, I mean, you think that a lot of times with AEW or even WWE overbooking, that had nothing compared to this card. Yeah, hundred percent. So let's get into it, man. Uh, in canon, what did we actually have as the opener on the show for? This offering of Halloween Havoc '97. Um, the, well, the, the the opening match was uh, Ultimo Dragon versus Yuji Nagata with Sonny Ono, and the storyline was is basically uh, Dragon having a, a bit of a feud with Sonny Ono after he re- uh, rejected Ono's offering of manager, and Ono was just bringing in guys to take out um, Dragon, and he brought in Yuji Nagata, who we actually just saw not too long ago on Dynamite. Nice. Well, uh, I've actually changed this. The, my card is going to be quite a bit different from what actually took place on this fateful night in October 26, 1997. So our opening match of Halloween Havoc 1997 is the WCW Cruiserweight Championship versus Mask. Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. I could not touch this match. One of the greatest matches in the history of WCW. Uh, you know, going back to when Ted Turner bought out the NWA and, and called it WCW all the way up until 2001 when Vince bought out the company. For that uh, period of time, I guess it would have been, what, uh, 13 years or so, 12 years. Probably one of the top matches in the history of the company when it was under that branding. Um, just a phenomenal match. People are still talking about it today. In fact, there's a company called Chalkline Apparel that makes uh, several different um, types of jackets and shorts and, and you know, uh, sweatpants and things of this nature for, uh, for different uh, wrestlers and different moments in WWE history, WCW and ECW. And they've actually made a ring jacket based on this match. That's how much it stands out in the lexicon of, of WCW and, and um, the, the Monday Night Wars. So this match had to stay. No, I wasn't going to touch a thing on it. What do you think? Um, first of all, this match did get PWI's uh, match of the year of 1997. And considering how good the re- some of the in-ring stuff was in 97, especially, say, Brett and Austin, that was talked about on Classic Match Classroom a couple of weeks ago on CountedOut7.com. <laughs> a cheap plug. Uh, but, um, yeah, though, this match, I mean, every again, you can't touch this match. This is... Probably uh, Eddie, uh, one of Eddie's best. Definitely one of Ray's best. I mean, again, yeah, there's nothing else you can say. The storyline, the, the move set, everything in this match was fantastic. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I, and I, I just felt that because of the type of match that it is and knowing how we're going to structure this card, I thought, what better way to start the show? I mean, that to me is, that is the way to start off a wrestling pay-per-view with a match like this you know they often talk about how the first match is as important as the last to set the pace and set the tempo for the evening so and again tyrone and i talk about this a lot on our show ebbs and flows of booking a card so you can't have constantly these matches where you have people up on high spots and um you can't have always matches that necessarily have these huge stakes to them you have to bring people on a journey you have to bring them up and bring them down so this is a way when you have the energy of the crowd already there they're excited to be there the pyro's going off they're they just you know got their first you know hot dog and their first beer they're gotten in their seat and they get this match as the opening offering i think it's the best possible way you could have opened the show oh i agree i mean there's a reason why wrestlemania a few times started off with money in the bank yeah 100 percent. So. Unless you have anything else to say on this one, obviously the match the, st- the match stays the same. The result is the same. Rey Mysterio goes over and wins the Cruiserweight Championship and retains his mask. Um, so from there, we're going to go on to match number two. What is actually on this card for match number two, my friend? Uh, Chris, uh, this was actually a um, bonus unadvertised match. Chris Jericho versus Ghetto. Um, and they, on the commentary, they actually played up that these two were tag partners and rivals in, um, in Japan. And just a, a side part here on the WWE network, if you watch this match, Jericho comes out to his original break the walls down when he had his debut against the rock in 99. 
Yeah, they do edit out a lot of the WCW themes. I have noticed that almost on every um, appearance that Jericho has on the network in terms of WCW, whether it's Nitro or, or a pay-per-view, he's always got his Break the Walls Down theme song. But with that being said, this match has actually changed. I have added something else in its stead. So the next match on the card will be a fairly new to the company, Bill Goldberg, going up against Mortis. Mm. Who better so, than Mortis? Pardon? Who better than Mortis? That's it, man. So um, this is a, a few weeks removed from the debut of Goldberg. And as such, I just felt it was important to keep the momentum of the new winning streak alive. Interesting to note that Goldberg debuted on September 22nd, 1997, which was the same week uh, that the opposite show, Monday Night Raw, or Raw's War at the time, had their first Monday Night Raw in Madison Square Garden. And that was the night where, obviously, Vince McMahon got the infamous first-ever stunner Mm -hmm. from Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it's pretty fun to think that, you know, there's always been this comparison between Austin and Goldberg. So you get Austin stunning Vince for the first time and Goldberg debuting, which is kind of funny how their careers parallel in that way. But... um, Sorry, wasn't that also the Raw where that was a Cactus Jack versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley? Yeah, and exactly. What's their debut in WWE? That's right. And we got that uh, pile driver through the table on the stage. Yeah. Um, I'm exactly. Sure we're thinking the same show. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. Um, so, that you know, this match would be a relative squash. Obviously, Mortis was the innovator of offense mm-hmm. uh, in WCW. He was very well renowned for that. And uh, being Goldberg's toughest challenge to date. Mortis would attempt some spectacular moves, including a second rope moonsault reversing into a DDT, which was countered into a power slam by Goldberg. Goldberg then hits the spear and the jackhammer on Mortis for the pin. And of course, Mortis and Raph were aligned at this time. So after um, Goldberg gets the pin on Mortis, Raph gets a spear for his trouble as he comes in to try to uh, get the upper hand on Goldberg at the same time. And of course, James Vandenberg is there trying to pick up the pieces. So I thought that'd be a fun little match. It's again, you know, bringing up the ebbs and flows. You just had this outstanding match with the cruiserweights and now you're going to bring them down with a heavy hitting power, power move match set and all our, sorry, uh, move set in a match that was going to be showcasing a newer talent in WCW. I thought it was a good way to kind of have an ebb and flow there. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, yeah, you're right though that uh, once you bring uh, the crowd up, uh, with uh, probably, again, would end up being match of the year, you'll have to do something that is a bit more ground and pound. I mean, Mortis, uh, Chris Canyon, again, an innovator of offense, allow him to get some moves in, but also you can't have Goldberg sell too much if you're going to try to build him up to the monster he eventually becomes. So is it not so much a squash, but a convincing win for Goldberg would be necessary in this situation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he wouldn't be selling much. It would just be more along the lines of Mortis getting more offense than anybody previous had gotten. I mean, it's only been a few weeks since he, maybe a month since he debuted, right? So Mm -hmm. uh, he would probably be, you know, this being Goldberg's first pay-per-view, he would probably would have gotten a little bit more in on Goldberg than anybody else, but it would still would have been a relative squash. And I can't think of a better person to make Goldberg look like a million bucks than Chris Canyon. So that kind of made sense to me. And The other thing about this card, too, is we were talking about ebb and flow. I mean, the first three matches on this card were cruiserweight matches, so it was a lot of the same for the first three matches. I think it's because they had Mike Tanay. Uh, They didn't show him in the arena, so I don't know if he just did his commentary over the phone. And they just had Mike Tanay do the three cruiserweight matches and recording, and that's all they could get him for. So they figured bang, 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 and then call it a night for Mike Tanay. Yeah, it certainly could have been. Uh, We are going to go back to the cruiserweights next. So what is the next match on the card? Uh, The third match on the card was Ray versus Eddie. Right. Okay, great. So this match has actually been changed now because we open with that. We have Chris Jericho going up against the Ultimo Dragon. Ooh, this would have been classic. So we have, uh, there's not much of a build to this one. I mean, so many of the matches on the undercard for WCW pay-per-views tended to be Matches that weren't really necessarily advertised or highly, you know, laced in story. It was more just uh, they would have these matches as as fillers or what have you. But this match does have a little bit of 
history to it that's alluded to in the commentary based on the fact that they'd wrestle in Japan and things of that nature. So as you'd expect, this match is an absolute classic. A lot of submission-based wrestling. The finish comes as Jericho is attempting his patented triple powerbomb combination. Mm -hmm. Jericho's on his second follow-through as the dragon reverses into a Frankenstein and then locks in a dragon sleeper and body scissors combination. And your winner is the Ultimo Dragon. It's funny. The only reason I would say I'd have Jericho go over is because you're still trying to build Jericho right now as as a baby face. Um, and right now, Jer- uh, Jericho still needed the wins. And on the original card, Ultimo Dragon did lose to submission. So I don't think at this point a loss would have hurt Dragon. I would have actually had Jericho go over. No, and that's totally fair. I get your reasoning for it. I just thought that, you know, if you have Jericho lose, you could always start planting those seeds of a heel turn. It wouldn't be long before we would get a heel turn. I think at the beginning of 1998, we would start seeing those uh, those tendencies starting to play out. And of course, these two matches or these two athletes would have an incredible match. So I would be completely fine with them doing a rematch, say on the Nitro the following night, or maybe even doing another doing another one of these matches at World War Three the following month. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like maybe having Jericho do the do the job here would kind of facilitate a rematch as opposed to having dragon lose. And then dragon would go on to do something else. Both guys were relatively new to North American audiences. So I feel like either way you were probably okay, but I understand your thinking. I, I did go back and forth on this finish. Yeah. No, they like said, I was just thinking if you're um, Jericho was still according to the term white meat baby face at the time. And with the, uh, I mean, the North American hardcores would have known um, Jericho with his uh, ECW run, but um, most of North America wouldn't know uh, Ultimo Dragon. Uh, he was a he or, uh, excuse me did have a cruiserweight title run at this time by this time because they were already talking on commentary about uh, all the titles he won. But yeah, no, I mean you could go either way. Um, Especially if it's a long competitive match, it really wouldn't hurt anybody. I just would rather have seen uh, the kid go over uh, with Chris Jericho going over Dragon, but I don't think Jericho taking a loss to to a veteran like Dragon would have really hurt him all that much. No, exactly. So uh, no, I'm right there with you. You can go one way, either way on it. I think um, either way, you probably could have done that rematch on Nitro the next night. They did tend to do that sometimes with some of the. Mm-hmm mid-card matches or lower-card matches on pay-per-views. They would have rematches the next night on Nitro. Uh, Specifically around this era, 96, 97, you'd see a lot of that. So, no, I I hear what you're saying for sure. Because that's when uh, Nitro was, what, three... Was Nitro three hours at this point? Um, I believe Nitro started going to three hours in March of 97, Okay, yeah, so Nitro was three hours at this point. So they needed I, felt, is what I was yeah. alluding to. I don't, him. you know what, that's a good question. See, because this is the thing, and I'm sure that you're, you're, you're aware of this as well, being a, a historian of sorts like I am. It's so hard sometimes, there's so much knowledge to remember that sometimes it's really easy to trip yourself up where you're trying to remember what year something happened, just because there's so much information that it overloads, overloads your brain a little bit sometimes. So I almost yeah. feel, I think it was March of 97, they went to three hours. Yeah, because I, th- I, been... yeah, I, think, I was thinking uh, before, uh, um, uh, what was it, uh, the uh, one year before the NWO uh, became into existence, uh, that Nitro was uh, three hours by that point. No, Nitro wasn't three hours until after the NWO, but I can't remember if it... No, I'm talking about one year uh, into the NWO anniversary sort of thing. Right, okay, yeah. I don't know if it... Yeah, see, there's a part of me that thinks it might have been 98, but anyways, we can fact check that and, and <laughs> we'll figure it out the next time we have you on. We'll talk about it. Oh, for uh, sure. If you want to come back on, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm enjoying I'm... having you on here, so thanks so much for jumping on with us, man. Yeah, no, anytime. I always love talking wrestling. Um, so, what's the next match that we have on the actual card 
Alex Wright with Deborah defeated and uh, Steve Mongo McMichael with help from um, Bill Goldberg. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the storyline into this was um, it was more of the rivalry between Deborah and Mongo, and she was just picking people to beat to face uh, Mongo, and she brought in Alex Wright. And then Goldberg basically came in with a ref, was distracted, absolutely terrible ref distraction. Um, speared and uh, Mongo throws, literally throws right on Mongo for the one, two, three. And then Spears and Jack Hammers right. Deborah gives uh, Mongo the, or gives Goldberg um, Mongo's uh, Super Bowl ring. Yeah, so this match is gone. Uh, this yeah. rivalry is gone. I mean, I'm fine with Mongo being in the Four Horsemen at this point um, and doing his own thing. Yeah, this this is kind of where this this pay per view started to fall off a cliff for me. Yeah, this uh, so is when the overbooking kicked in. Exactly. So so what I've done here is I've actually inserted in its stead a WCW World Tag Team Championship match. I have the Steiner brothers as champions defending the titles against Vicious and Delicious. Scott Norton and Buff Bagwell. Oh, God. So uh, the Steiners had regained the titles on the October 3rd edition of Nitro. Nash was injured, and as such, Wolfpack Rules had six team with Hall to defend the championships. With Hall's hands full at Halloween Havoc facing his opponent, the NWO's Vicious and Delicious were tasked to regain the titles. So then the Steiners would be the victims of several beatdowns by the NWO leading into the match. The match itself is a hard-hitting encounter with Norton and Scott um, Steiner starting off, starting things off. After Norton manages to cut the ring off via a dragon screw leg whip, Bagwell is tagged in. And as, as customary for Buff, he's more interested in posing than wrestling, allowing Scott to make a hot tag to Rick after two failed attempts. Rick hits a couple of clotheslines and a power slam on Buff. Norton blind tags Buff and is poised to deliver a chop block to Rick. When Scott intercepts Norton with a Steiner line, Rick gets up on the second rope and lands a second rope bulldog and gets the pin. Your winner and still WCW Tag Team Champions, the Steiner Brothers. Yeah, I've got no problem in that. Um, sometimes you really forget how good a worker uh, Scott Norton is. Um until uh until you actually see him work especially his stuff with the nwo because i mean you i mean everybody who knew knew him from japan knew he was a tough son of a bitch but then when you see him in uh in wcw it's like holy crap for a guy with a bit the same build but a bit shorter than bam bam biglow this guy could really work i mean his job was basically to try to get buff over didn't work but um and they said he did his job. His role in the NWO was perfect for him. Yeah. And, and I think that he's one of those underrated guys as well that um, he really didn't get his just due of exactly to your point, how tough and how, how good a worker he was. I would have loved to have seen him have a run in the Fed, maybe mm -hmm. at some point, even like during Ruthless Aggression or something like that. You know, after oh, Vince would have loved him in the early 2000s. Oh, yeah. He would have been great. But I think he was just, you know, he was very comfortable in Japan. He was making a ton of money there. Yeah, so, there's no reason for him to leave. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even during this time working for WCW, he was still, he was still splitting dates with, with Japan as well. So um, that's the main reason I wanted to get these this match on the card was I thought that getting uh, Norton and Bagwell, who were actually a pretty decent team. Buff Bagwell was an underrated worker. Uh, when he wanted to work, he could be, do a really, really good job. He just sometimes wasn't motivated. Of course, you have Steiner Brothers, who are one of the greatest tag teams of all time. So I think this match on paper looks decent, and I think it would be a, a good way to, again, ebb and flow. And you need to get a really solid tag team outing on the card. So I yeah, thought, why there, not? Yeah, there was no tag team match on this card, was there? No. No. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, what do we have next up on our card? Oh, we got the classic Jacqueline versus TV champ Disco Inferno. In a singles match, TV title wasn't on the line. Um, most of this was chase around Disco, afraid to hit a woman, and then uh, and Jackie wins um, with uh, at least uh, one nip slip from uh, Jackie that even uh, Bobby Heenan goes, can I get a replay? <laughs> yeah, well, Jackie had a tough time keeping, uh, keeping 
them in, to say the least, uh, with her outfit on this one. Yeah, well, I mean, that was sort of indicative of, you know, we saw that in the WWF as well. So it seemed yeah. as though that was sort of, I don't know if that was part and parcel to to what she was into. I don't know if that was her idea or if that was creative's idea. But no, nonetheless, we did uh, we did get a glimpse. We did get a glimpse from from time to time. Um, this match is gone. Uh, yeah. I felt we needed to maybe put something in its place. So I actually have something else happening. I have the next uh, segment as Conan entering the arena and challenging any former chap- champion in the back to come on out and get their ass kicked. This is K-Dog. You know, he had just been um, in a rivalry with a lot of the cruiserweights that he had helped bring into the company before he turned into the, turned to the NWO. Mm-hmm. So now he's trying to maybe change gears and trying to maybe go after some more heavyweight competition. So I don't know if you're going to like this or you're not going to like it, but the man who answers the challenge from Conan is none other than Greg the Hammer Valentine, who was under contract for WCW and had been very sparsely seen on WCW television. He gets a decent pop. The match is relatively short with the Hammer going for more of a slow-paced start. Conan is simply too fast for the aging Valentine, and after a flurry of offense from Greg, as well as a hope spot, Conan gets the upper hand with a stiff drop kick to the back and a side suplex. He then locks in the tequila sunrise for the submission. Your winner in fairly short order, Conan. Um, Choosing Greg the Hammer is an interesting choice. I didn't realize he was on WCW's roster at the time. That's news to me. Um, But yeah, no, uh, if you're, I mean, Conan, yeah, like you said, he's coming off that um, showing at uh, war games the month before. You want to keep him in the uh, spotlight. Uh, a squash match over a veteran is is never a bad thing for him. It keeps him going, and it keeps him relevant, I guess, is the best way to do it. Because all those uh, this is when the NWO expansion was starting to get out of hand. And um, just to basically to keep another guy relevant is never really a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, for me personally, I, if you look at the WCW in terms of who they had on their roster – I just felt as though, first of all, I wasn't even 100% sure that Valentine was on the roster either until I saw it on a roster page that I looked up earlier today. Once I saw his name, I just couldn't get his name out of my head, and I started to think, you know what, he's there, he can still work, he could still move. He wasn't the kind of wrestler who was going to be slowed down because he was an aerial offensive wrestler. He was a ground-and-pound guy, so you could still have a match with him, no problem. He was in his mid to late forties at this point. So he could still go. Um, And I just felt as though because of the history that the hammer had with so many of the other top tier superstars on the roster, your Hogan's, your, your savages, your, your pipers and what have you. I -hmm. felt like this is a great way to get him a, get him a pay-per-view payday. And then of course, you know, you get Conan going over, as you said, an established star with a long history you know, he was at Starcade 83 against mm-hmm. Roddy Piper in that dog collar match. So oh. he has rich history in the company. You know what? Give a give give the hammer a, a pay-per-view payday. Why not? Yeah, give him his due. Uh, I think so. I, I, I've always loved I always liked Greg the Hammer Valentine, a former Intercontinental Champion. And like I said, him and uh Beefcake, uh underrated tag team. Yeah, the dream team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, now we're going on to the uh, the next match on our card, which on paper is what, sir? Uh, Kurt Henning uh, um, for the U.S. Championship beat uh, Ric Flair of uh, disqualification, which is just an overbooked mess. Uh, this is um, Flair getting revenge on Henning for slamming his uh, head into the war game cage only a month ago and Flair basically not selling it. Yeah, so the next match on our card is for the WCW World Television Championship, and it's Disco Inferno as your World Television Champion defending against the crippler Chris Benoit. It's it's funny that you mentioned Benoit, because what I would have done is I would have kept this match, but I would have had Kurt Henning beat other Four Horsemen members to get to Ric Flair for Starcade, and I would have had Henning versus Benoit here. Nice. Yeah, no, that's not a bad way to go for sure. I had a different idea of where, what I was going to do with Hennig uh, on, on tonight's uh, pay-per-view. I like your idea. 
it's not a bad idea at all to run the gauntlet. You can start with Mongo and then go through Benoit and then what have you, right? So I think that would be a, a fun way to go for sure. Um, and you could do it leading up to say, I don't know if you could stretch that all the way to Starcade because you only have two other members of the of the Horsemen at this point, but definitely your point is to, at least till World War Three we could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, with this match, I have Disco. He's been running his mouth for all for weeks on end, asking for real competition as he accumulates victories either by disqualification or count out or using the ropes for leverage. Finally, on the go home Nitro after another one of these tainted victories over Brad Armstrong. Chris Benoit enters the arena and announces that he is the next challenger for the television title. The match is really well worked with Disco bumping all over the place for Benoit. Benoit may as well have been, you know, manning the grill at Morton's this night because he was a chop fest. He was just making his chest hamburger meat, him being Disco Inferno, followed by a few German suplexes for good measure. Then, of course, we have Disco looking like he might make a comeback as he rakes the eyes of the Crippler, but once again is chopped into next week and locked into the crossface. Your winner and new television champion, Chris Benoit. Anytime anybody puts uh, put the title on Benoit at the time, I'm the last person to object to it. Um, yeah, no, I could see basically Benoit taking the disco, taking disco to Betty Hannes, um, turn his chest into what Daniel Bryan's looked like at the after the Greatest Royal Rumble. Um, yeah, like I said, at this time I was put any title on Benoit and sign me up. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I feel like um, Disco Disco was a, was a character that didn't need a championship. I felt like no. his character was strong enough uh, in the position that it was in. He didn't need to put a title on him. You could have an interesting program with him or just have him be that guy. Disco to me was almost like one man band Heath Slater of today's roster. Like you didn't need a title on him. He, 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 could, he could entertain the crowd. You could get a good match out of him and... Put him in a program if you want, but if not, you can always count on him to, to be a, a fairly solid hand. So that's the way exactly. I look at it. Yeah. So the next match on the card, my friend, is what? Lex Luger versus uh, Scott Hall with six. And Larry Zabisco, a special guest referee. Um, Luger goes over after, originally Scott Hall went over, but they Zabisco uh, said, let me look at the replay. See, six interfered. Restarts the match almost immediately. Luger gets him up in the um, in the torture rack. Scott Hall gives up, and then it's just a NWO beatdown on Zabisco and uh, Luger. Yeah, this this match for me uh, more or less stayed the same, with the exception of I don't have Luger on the in the match. I've substituted the Giant for for Luger. And the reason for this is I just felt like the Luger and Hall match that I saw was a pretty weak match. I wasn't interested in seeing this match again. So I thought with the Giant, you could play on that dynamic, of course, of having the Giant been in the in the NWO previously. You could go back and forth on that a little bit. And, of course, the dynamic of the match would change quite a bit. So the match, as I said, stays relatively the same. Hall was able to hit the outsider's edge from the second rope as Six had kicked the giant in the head who was presumably going for a second rope lariat. Hall then gets the pin, but Zabisco overturns the decision. The finish comes after a poised giant is waiting to nail Hall with the choke slam. Your winner's the giant, but then, of course, the same sort of thing happens. You have the NWO come out and try to just run roughshod over the giant Zabisco. Luger comes out as well in street clothes, tries to help, but he gets torn down too. And so now you kind of have the situation where going forward, it's all building towards this Sabisco and Hall match, uh, which mm-hmm. I'm fine with. I mean, I've always been a fan of when somebody goes after JR and Jerry the King Lawler, you know, defends JR's honor. I've always been a big, it's always been kind of a goosebump, guilty pleasure moment for me when I see Lawler defend JR and, you know, beat the tar out of Taz or something like that. I love that stuff. Yeah, uh, WWE did that too a little bit last year with, um, what was it, Seth Rollins or somebody like that going after um, Todd Phillips and Samoa Joe got in the way. Said, yeah. you're going to pick on him, you got to go through me first. Yeah, and I love that stuff. I think it's great. So mm-hmm. I'm all for the Zabisco, you know, Scott Hall thing. That's fine with me. Uh, the match itself, you know, going forward a few months later at the, uh, 
at the Starcade pay per view was actually a decent match. So I'm I'm all for it. Um, I just thought that changing up the dynamic of putting the giant in there instead of Luger, I just think that the giant and, and Scott Hall had a little bit more chemistry in ring than Luger and the and Hall did. Yeah, I, I honestly I was never I've never been a fan of uh, Lex Luger's in ring work. So if you get Luger out of the ring, I'm fine with that. I understand the attraction because he I mean just look at him, but I've never been a Luger fan. Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm all I'm all for having Luger wrestle. I mean, there's just certain guys that don't have chemistry with certain guys. Just on paper, even Luger and Scott Hall doesn't sound like a good match to me. Not to say that the Giant and Scott Hall necessarily sounds like a, you know, a Matt Classic either. But I do <laughs> think that that there's a dynamic there with it with you know Hall being the cocky heel and a big mm-hmm. man himself going up against the Giant. I think maybe would it be a more compelling story to tell. I I think so too. I mean. The giant big show, Paul White, whatever you want to call him. At this time, he was the, one of the more athletic big men in the in uh, in the sport, I guess you want to call it. But uh, yeah, like I said, just get Luger off my television. Okay, fair enough. Well, he yeah. came for a run and it got beat down, so you don't have to watch him wrestle tonight. Um, exactly. What's the next match on our card, man? Um, Randy Savage with Miss Elizabeth uh, beat DDP in a Las Vegas sudden death match, which is essentially a last man standing match. Um, yeah. The key with this one, though, is uh, Elizabeth uh, got in the way of some true heel work, which is always stunning to see Miss Elizabeth. And then uh, the Diamond Doll, Kimberly, grabs her by the hair and pulls her to the outside. And again, after some more interference and stuff like that, a fake sting comes out with a baseball bat. And goes after DDP's ribs and can't answer the ten count. They alluded it to being Hogan because um, had uh, Hollywood uh, boots, uh, wrestling boots on. Yeah, and so for me, this match stays exactly the same. Uh, it's you know this was feud of the year in '97 by you know wrestling magazines and PWI and all that kind of thing. We called it the re- the feud of the year. So. Um, I decided to keep it. The only thing is I don't have a fake sting coming out to uh, nail DDP in the ribs. I just have more Savage just working over the ribs to the point that DDP can't can't answer the 10 count. I didn't think that there was necessary to have that that wrinkle in the story, especially because we'd seen so much of the fake sting stuff, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to this. So I kind of just felt like let's leave that sting part of it alone. Especially the fake sting, you know, like I'm, if it's the real sting, then fine. He comes out and, you know, helps DDP go over, then I'm okay with that maybe. But uh, the fake sting uh, aspect of it, I just took it all together. And I just think it also, it's sort of analogous to, to what happened with Bret Hart and Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13. I mean, you have that valiant, I mean, obviously DDP was already a, a face at this point, but you have that valiant face who's trying everything he can to, to to um, answer that ten count, but he just can't do it, and I think that that would make him more over as a face than it would having being uh, been eviscerated by by a fake Sting's baseball bat. Yeah, it made this match made to me. It made Savage look a little weak. I'm a huge. I've always been a huge Savage fan, even when uh, he turned on Hogan. Uh, I was I was always a Savage fan. So anytime it's like Savage. I don't understand Savage as a heel, and obviously at this time, heels never won clean. But I would have liked to see him give Savage a bit more credit and just do, like, repeated elbow drops. Instead, in the chest, uh, Savage intentionally dropped elbows on the ribs. Yeah, that's sort of what I was thinking. And then you just have it at that point where, where DDP is trying, as hard as he's trying, just can't can't get there. Yeah, and I can't think- even grab a rope or something to pull yeah. something. Maybe you have him do that gimmick where he coughs up blood or something like that. I mean, I just think that's the better way to go in ter- instead of having another run-in. We haven't really, in terms of the way I've booked this card, I haven't had any run-in so far. Just because I just didn't want to overexpose certain matches. I mean, I'm fine with clean finishes. Um, you know, I, I did obviously have the one and run-in with, with the Giant and Scott Hall, but that wasn't really necessarily a run-in as much as it was just a quick kick behind the, the ref's back. You didn't have a whole yeah. schmoz of people running out, you know, like every nitro at the time ended with a huge brawl every single week. I didn't sort of like what a lot of AEW matches have been getting uh, heat for, which is uh, after every match, it goes back to an angle. Yeah. Which is fine. I'm fine. 
I'm fine with an angle, but I don't, I don't need, I don't need everybody on the roster on the show every week is my exactly point. Yeah. And I think that's your point too. So what do you think so far? How are you feeling about the card so far that we've booked? Um, definitely a lot, a lot better. First of all, including a tag match is always great because uh, I think nowadays, if you did a pay-per-view, that's nothing but singles matches. It'd get torn to shreds. Um, even WWE is not a big tag team company. They, like I said, just last night on uh, Extreme Rules, they still had uh, two tag matches. So, I mean, I know T- Tyler Lo- Love is a huge fan of tag team wrestling, so am I. So, I mean, if you can mix it up with uh, some tag team matches instead of just basically seven singles matches, I'm all for it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so with that being said, perfect segue. Uh, what is our next match on the card? Next match on the card is the main event. It's Piper versus Hogan in a steel cage match that it wasn't quite hell in a cell. It wasn't quite a steel traditional steel cage. It was a cage that basically surrounded the ring in a, about maybe a foot of foot or two of the, um, of around the ring and then it was just a door but i guess it was what one of those uh, 16 17 foot high cages that you just basically placed are around the ring and around the steel steps uh they had after a ton of interference fake stings you name it savage doing the worst double acts miss onto hogan you'll ever see um piper wins by uh submission with a sleeper fan jumps in the ring trying to save uh, piper gets the living crap kicked out of him, and then we go to credits to end the show. Yeah, and I mean, so a couple of things before we get into what I've booked here. Uh, this may be the most atrocious-looking cage I've ever seen in the history of wrestling. It was pathetic. Um, the WWF at the time was calling this main event Age in the Cage. Which yep. was, yeah, I mean... I will say, I'll give Savage credit, you know, doing the double axe off the top of the cage, I'm fairly confident uh, that Savage must have wrecked one of his knees on that. I mean, I don't, maybe not to the point where he needed to be off for time or what have you, but did you see the way he landed? Yeah, well, he did take time off not too long ago when he came back with Miss Madness, um, Molly Holly, Gorgeous George, and... Um, came out with uh, that new gimmick where he actually had one more title run in him. But yeah, Savage, uh, after basically this, he does the feud with DDP and then he's off TV for a while. And I think it's because he wrecked his knee on this. Yeah, he was, he was in and out in the beginning of 98. I mean, he had that match with Bret Hart at Slamboree 98. And then of course he had some other matches throughout the summer of 98 as well. But uh, you know, he, to your point, he was sort of in and out at this point, you know, he, he would be sporadic. And uh, he did have some matches in 98 with Hogan and stuff as well. So I know that he was around. I think more towards by the time we get to 99, he's really kind of in for for a cup of coffee. And then that's it. But uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, this match, this match was was not good. And awful. I mean, we had already seen at the Starcade previous 96. We had seen Hogan versus Piper. And of course, Piper got got the win over Hogan clean with us with this, with the sleeper hold. And then we saw the rematch at, uh, at uh, super brawl uh, in San Francisco, you know, Piper's famous line, you know, San Francisco, watch my fist go. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we'd already seen this match twice. I didn't need to see a third, um, especially in, in this cage. It was awful. So what I've done here is I'm doing a tag team match. I'm doing Hollywood Hogan and Kurt Hennig versus Rowdy Roddy Piper and Ric Flair. Okay. So what I've got here is after Hennig turned on the horseman at Fall Brawl, he and Hogan are on the top of the world the following night. There's a match signed for the main event of Nitro. Hennig versus Flair with the horseman and the NWO banned from ringside. Hogan then, of course, finds his way to ringside and interferes with no horseman in sight. They were all beat down by the NWO backstage. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Piper appears and makes the save for Flair. The match is signed for Havoc. It's a brawl with all four men out for blood. Once the match settles, Piper is on the receiving end of a, receiving end, excuse me, of relentless abuse to his hip. 
Much like the Steiner match previous, the ring is cut in half. Piper gets the boots from Hogan. At this point, both Henning and Hogan have their way with Piper. Henning is holding up Roddy as, as Hogan slaps him in the face. This enrages Piper, who has an f- offensive flurry. At the same time, Flair, who can't take it anymore, comes into the ring to take out Henning. Piper, who is barely able to stand, gets the sleeper on Hogan as Flair and Henning brawl in the aisleway. Bischoff bolts down the aisle past the brawl, and the referee, Charles Robertson, who's jo- Robinson, excuse me, who's trying to restore some order. Eric hits Roddy with one of his martial arts kicks to the back. Piper releases Hogan and then grabs Eric by the hair. Hogan lands a low blow on Piper and then nails Roddy with brass knucks in the head for the pin as Bischoff orders Robinson into the ring to make the count. Flair and Henning continue to brawl with Flair beating like a sieve, bleeding like a sieve. Bischoff and Hogan clear the ref out of the ring and then beat down Piper until suddenly Sting lowers from the rafters and clears the ring with his baseball bat. Both Hogan and Bischoff are not hit and manage to escape unharmed, but we go off the air with Sting helping Piper to his feet and staring down Hogan. Uh, and so this to be a straight tag, no, um, no like extreme rules or anything goes or uh, what I guess uh, Texas Tornado rules, just straight tag. I think it's one of those matches where the, you know, the story is told by the commentators that they, the refs letting a lot of leeway here. You know, you're going to see, you know, a lot of very long 10 counts, people breaking 10 counts. You're going to have fights in the aisle. Like I said, it's just a pure six brawl breaking down between both guys. Flair is going to do color on the apron or on the, on the aisle way with, with headache. And basically to me, because of the way we've booked uh, fall brawl and having uh, Hennig turn on Flair, I thought it was too soon to do the first big match at Halloween Havoc. I thought we needed to maybe try and build up the stakes a little bit more. So yeah, let's use this. Let's use this as an opportunity to build the tension in the story a little bit higher. Yeah, I agree. That's why I when I originally saw it's like. They're doing Flair Henning less than a month after Henning slammed his head. First of all, Flair should, next time you see Flair for the next month, he should have, be having a neck brace on. Um, and then if they're going to do Flair Henning, to me, you build it up to your biggest show of the year after um, the whole Arn Anderson tribute. And then what I would have done up for Starcade is Flair versus Henning and Double A be the referee. Um, but in a situation like this, if you're going to have uh, Henning and Flair face each other in a tag match, I, I would have gone uh, Texas Tornado rules and just basically no tags, just all four guys in the ring going nuts. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that. My my only my only thinking was that uh, if we do throw the rules out too early, then it just becomes a big cluster. Whereas I think if you have some structure to the match and it breaks down, I think it adds some drama to the match because you're waiting and you're anticipating for when this is going to break open. I mean, you start off with this huge brawl in the beginning and then if things settle down, you get everybody into their you know obligatory corners and then from there it starts to build the tension. When's this thing going to explode? And then when it finally does, it's a big payoff for the crowd. Yeah, especially when you get a hot tag. That's usually the best thing for a tag match is the hot tag. Yeah, exactly. And at this point, you didn't get that hot tag because Flair just finally just had enough. And so my thinking as well is I didn't, it didn't occur to me when I was booking this until after I had booked it that why don't we do Bischoff versus Piper at Starcade? I mean, that might be a fun match. So I mean, that uh, it, it'd be very similar to Austin Bischoff at uh, No Way Out 2003, um, where it's basically a glorified beatdown, but it's you're giving the fans what they want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, we've already booked... Tyrone and I have already booked our Starcade uh, 1997, mm-hmm. so we have one month now between between uh, this this event and then our Starcade. So I have to try to make sense of World War Three at some point to to kind of bridge the gap because a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of going forward to Starcade is not what's booked for our Starcade. Yeah. So so it, you know. Sometimes you get caught in that trap, but uh, yeah, we'll make sense of it. Is, it's a lot like a Friday the thir- the Friday Thirteenth series. Continuancy is not the, the makes the most yeah. sense. Absolutely. So, 
so no, I, it's it's uh, it's a fun it's a fun uh, it's a labor of love for sure, and, and you know I'll be able to make it's wrestling, which is which is the beauty of it. So be able to make heads or tails of whatever we do at um, World War Three. We'll be able to tie the or sorry bridge that gap between the booking we did today and then the booking we did uh, back in December. But um, with that being said, my friend, thank you so much for jumping on. Um, are you interested in coming back and maybe you taking the the pencil sometime? Yeah, I think, yeah, now that I, I mean, like I said, I've listened to a few of your episodes before, um, and uh, now that I'm doing this with you, I've got a better feel um, of uh, what to do, as opposed to just basically say, like, the opening match of uh, Dragon and Nagata, um, instead of, because I, I honestly would have kept that match, but I would have done, I would have thrown the stip in there, if Dragon wins, he gets five minutes with Sonny Ono. But right. um, the way that you've uh, rebooked it and just moved things around makes a little more sense to me. i um, going, okay, it gives me some more ideas to have some fun. Well, that's just it, right? So our, our, our main objective is to just make sure that everything is kind of cohesive with, with what's happening in terms of what we booked previously or, or ahead of time. So if we've booked, say, Fall Brawl or if we've booked Starcade or what have you, then we can kind of put, the, you know, all, all, it all makes sense in terms of, the world that we're creating and on top of that we just do stuff like making sure that you know if somebody's injured like nash was injured at this time legit we weren't going to use him on the card or you know you're mm-hmm. not going to have you know steve austin appear at, at halloween havoc just just for the hell of it it has to be the yeah. same rosters and all that kind of thing but yeah i mean hell if you want one time it's like you and tyrone could both uh book a certain card and i vote for the person who uh, the card I would take the most, something like that. That could be Yeah, hundred percent. That would be a lot of fun too. We also, uh, because of what we're doing right now, we're doing a limited series event called card subject to change. We're doing a lot of different things that we don't typically do. So we're kind of throwing our format out the window. It was fun to get back to the rebooking again this week, but uh, next week, actually we have uh, Nick from the universal wrestling podcast coming on to talk about the top seven Brock Lesnar matches from 2012 to 2019 so that's something to really look forward to as well oh, for um sure. yeah really looking forward to recording that one there's a couple of really good matches on there some unsung heroes and and matches people i'm sure have forgotten about that uh were just outstanding so looking forward to doing that one um steve could you tell us where everybody can find you on social media you can tell us a little bit more about your podcast again just give us a couple more uh minutes of info here on where we can find you buddy yeah, um, if you just want to follow the man, myself, I'm on Twitter at at SteveBorn1. Uh, the E8 podcast is uh, is on Facebook, uh, Spotify, Anchor. Um, Griff is on uh, on uh, Twitter as well. Um, just have, uh, he just got a new Twitter account, so uh, they'll have to basically uh, go through me and and find him as well, but. Uh, yeah, no, uh, like you said, we just recorded an episode about a few, uh, about, I guess about a week or so ago. And we're again, he just got married not too long ago and just came back from honeymoon. So he's got some work to catch up on. But uh, yeah, no, that uh, episode should be up shortly when we did the top eight uh, J, uh, trades in uh, Blue Jays history. And uh, yeah, we should be recording something soon to uh, preview uh, the NHL season. I'm a huge Leaf fan. He's not. So there's, there's always the fun conflict and me getting roasted and then me uh, trying to defend defend my boys in blue and white. Never an easy thing to do. <laughs> Never so. A lot of times, like, trying to uh, defend uh, anything WWE <laughs> does lately. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, you'll, I mean, you just go back in the archives. You can, I've done a few lists for uh, Mike and Tyler. One I did about a year ago on the top seven Hell in a Cell matches. And uh, just before around Mania season, I did the top seven HBK uh, WrestleMania matches. So you can find me on the uh, on the EA, on the EA podcast as well as uh, the Counted Out uh, family, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And you do a great job over there on Counted Out when you guest for them as well. We I've listened to all your lists that you've done. The HBK list was good. Uh, had some disagreements with the hell in the cell list. I can't lie, but uh, that's what it's all about. We we get on here and we we hoot and holler and scream and yell and romp and stomp, but we have a lot of fun and it's all in the sake of entertainment and just getting to 
scratch that itch that we all have to talk about wrestling's past. I feel like in so many circles and so many occasions that uh, in terms of my enjoyment of wrestling, it's more looking in the rear view mirror than the, uh, than the front windshield these days. But um, so it's a lot of fun to have somebody like yourself come on. We can't thank you enough, Steve, for coming and joining us uh, for this week's episode. And we'll definitely have you back. I'd love to see you rebook something yourself. You can pick anything you like and we can go from there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this week's offering of the Good Friends, Better Enemies podcast. We are going to continue on, as alluded to earlier, with our card subject to change limited series event. We have a couple of great shows on tap, including next week's offering of Brock Lesnar's top seven matches. That's right. We are stealing the Counted Out Sevens format once again for top seven Brock Lesnar matches from 2012 to 2019. And we're going to look forward to speaking with Nick from the Universal Wrestling Podcast regarding that particular list. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, you can find us on Twitter at good underscore enemies and on Instagram at good double underscore enemies. And for myself, for Steve Bourne, not Evan Airborne, and for the E8 podcast, for myself, for Tyrone, for CountedOut7.com, and for... Stings Baseball Bat, the Good Friends Better Me's podcast. Thanks you very much.